It is so good to be saved. <laughs> wow, how unworthy we we are of that incredible privilege. You know, like it or not, we are involved in a war. And it's a war with an enemy that we really can't see. Even in the Old Testament, almost 900 years before the birth of Christ, we get a glimpse of this battle through the prophet Elisha. The city where Elisha was staying was surrounded by an army of Syrian soldiers determined to capture and execute this prophet. Elisha's servant went out in the morning and saw this massive army that was arrayed against his master and was understandably quite terrified. And in response, Elisha calmly told his servant, he said, he said, don't be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, Please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened his eyes of this young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots all around Elisha. You can only imagine how shocked Elisha's servant was when he he saw this. Now this mountain full of horses and chariots of fire were angels, and they were sent by the Lord to fight for Elisha. But we also know that there is a smaller but nonetheless formidable horde of demons also. And like the angels, we can't see them, but we know that they are there. Two weeks ago, we began looking at Paul's exhortation to the Christians in Ephesus about this spiritual battle that's going on. And in doing so, Paul was letting them know that they're Christian lives need to be lived out with a wartime mentality. And fast forwarding to today, things really haven't changed. As Christians, we are in a spiritual war too. And in order to survive and thrive in the midst of this conflict, we must fight it intelligently. And thus this morning, we will continue studying Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 17. Letting God's Word teach us about the Christian's warfare. Uh, Please turn to that passage in your Bible and read along with me. The Apostle Paul said, Finally, be strong in the Lord, in the strength of His might. Put on the full armor of God so that you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against powers, against world forces of this darkness, against spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you'll be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith, with which you'll be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation, and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now before we move on, into looking at the specific items of armor, let's, let's do a little mini-review here. In verse 10, Paul instructed the Ephesians in their preparation for this war, which was accomplished by strengthening their understanding of the Lord's incredible power and living in the insurance that that strength was actually theirs. In verse 11a, Paul instructed the Ephesians about the equipment for the war which was the full armor of God, which we'll study more about today as well as next week. And putting on the full armor of God would equip them to stand firm. In verses 11b through 12, Paul gave instruction about the enemy in this battle, which is the devil and his demons. 
And Paul called this war, if you notice in the text there, he called it a struggle. Now, in that day, a struggle was a hard-fought wrestling match. Literally hand-to-hand combat. Think mixed martial arts, and you get the picture of what's being referred to here. But as long as we put on the spiritual armor and fight biblically, the enemy's defeat is absolutely certain. The enemy can influence us as Christians, but he can never control, nor can he possess us. We are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and thus possession by demons absolutely cannot happen to us. Also, the demons can only do what the Lord specifically permits. They do not have free reign. And no matter how many hits we take in the battle, as true Christians, we can never lose our salvation. We are held securely in the Father's hand, and no one can snatch us away from Him. And last but not least, in verse 13, Paul gave instruction about the strategy for the war. And the strategy is to put on the full armor of God, to resist and to stand firm. We're not called to storm the gates of the enemy, but to resist, plant our feet, and stand firm. Now let's look at the pieces of armor that we must put on to resist and stand firm. As a general observation, note that the three pieces of armor in verses 14 through 15 are put on, and the three pieces of armor in verses 16 and 17 are taken up. And the first three pieces of armor are like pieces of clothing put on in preparation for the upcoming battle. The most basic gear is that which is essential for the warfare, and that's what these are. The second three pieces are are picked up and they're carried to the battle scene where they are either put on or taken up right before the battle starts. Now, today we'll be talking about the first three pieces of the spiritual armor that we must put on before we wage war. So look with me at verse 14, where Paul instructs, he says, Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth. And notice that this is the third time that Paul instructs the Ephesians to stand firm in the battle. He really wants to make sure that they get that right. And as we stand firm, Paul instructs his readers to have already girded their loins with the truth. Now, girding your loins is a, is a literal translation of the original language used here and is a fancy way of saying to fasten a belt around your waist. So, the first piece of spiritual armor that we must put on is the belt of truth. Now we have to understand a bit about the clothing of a typical Roman soldier to grasp why this seemingly incidental item of clothing would be so important. I mean a belt is certainly not the first thing that you would urge someone to put on. In Roman society as a whole, the normal mode of dress was the toga. Here's the toga. And you can see that a toga would be, it would be a total disaster in hand-to-hand combat. Your movement would be greatly restricted and you would very easily just trip over the thing and fall down. So for use in combat, something more practical was needed. A Roman soldier wore a shorter version of the toga called a tunic. And it only went down to the knees, but was still somewhat loose and flowing. So, though it was not likely to trip up a warrior, it could still hinder their movement if it was flapping around. And if it was left unbelted, it could provide the opportunity for an enemy soldier to grab the tunic and pull it over his head, or else grab the tunic and pull him down. Either situation would likely have a very deadly outcome. So the belt of a Roman soldier pulled together all of the loose ends of the clothing while 
allowing unhindered movement. It also provided a place for Roman soldiers to hang small weapons on, like daggers and things like that. Without this belt, a Roman soldier was indeed vulnerable to the attacks of the enemy. Now, in our text, Paul identifies this foundational piece of spiritual armor as the belt of truth. And certainly, when you are fighting an enemy who is called a liar and deceiver, truth is a very appropriate belt. Being well studied in the truth of God's word is essential in the battle against our enemy, the deceitful schemer. But putting on the belt of truth is even more about about putting on truthfulness, which is an attitude of the heart. It means that we that we so fully embrace the truth of God's Word, that in all sincerity and truthfulness, we commit ourselves to living it. In the context of the spiritual battle which we face, it means that we make a full commitment to engage in the spiritual battle which we face and to dedicate ourselves to emerge a winner. It means that we put aside all of the hindrances and the distractions of this world and tuck in all the loose ends of our lives in preparation for the war. As one commentator put it, he said, truth represents not only the accuracy of specific truths, but the quality of truthfulness. That seems to be the primary meaning that Paul has in mind here. The Christian is to gird himself in an attitude of total truthfulness. To be girded with truth, therefore, shows an attitude of readiness and genuine commitment. It is the mark of the sincere believer who forsakes hypocrisy and sham. Every encumbrance that might hinder the work of the Lord is gathered and tucked into his belt of truthfulness so that it will be out of the way. And putting on this belt of truthfulness, of sincere commitment, is the mark of those whom the Lord mightily uses. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, Paul stated, Paul stated this, he said, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Therefore, I run in such a way, not as without aim. I box in such a way, not as beating the air, but I discipline my body and make it my slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself might not be disqualified. Now that... There is truthfulness. That's it. Paul lived this out. He made a sincere commitment to living his Christian life truthfully. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, Paul also urged his chief disciple, Timothy, to make a sincere commitment to truthful living as well. He said, Timothy, suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. The way of truthfulness, of sincere commitment, was also the way of Jesus himself. Again, he both lived it out and taught it to his disciples. In Luke chapter 9, verse 23, Jesus exhorted his disciples... If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And make no mistake, there is a cost involved in putting on the belt of truthfulness. If we truly strap on this piece of armor, 
we are announcing that we are done playing around in our Christian lives. We purpose by the power of the Spirit to let go of living to please ourselves and adopt a daily mindset of living to please the Lord. We declare ourselves to ourselves and to the Lord that we are going to live as soldiers of the cross. We let go of mediocrity in our Christian lives, realizing that we pay a price for such spiritual apathy. One commentator stated it this way very well, saying, to be content with mediocrity, with lethargy, with indifference, with half-heartedness, is to fail to be armored with the belt of God's truth and to leave oneself exposed to Satan's schemes. You see, the devil is seriously committed to fighting us. He wants to take us down, to render us ineffective in the spiritual battle, to strip us of our joy in Christ. And he goes all out to accomplish this. Unless we are equally committed, we will end up being routed by our enemy. As I've studied this passage over the past few months, I have had to revisit my own putting on of the belt of truth. Am I still committed to sincerely following Christ? To disciplining my body and making it my slave in order to avoid disqualification? To doing what is necessary to win the battle with my adversary rather than just settle for a truce? These are questions that I've asked myself. And I'm far from perfect. There's no doubt about that, but... I have recommitted myself to putting on and keeping on the belt of truthfulness, trusting in the power of God's Holy Spirit to do so. Will you join me today in that commitment? Referring to your message outline, putting on the belt of truth is not only a commitment to the truth of God's Word, but even more importantly, It is a commitment to living your Christian life truthfully and sincerely. Putting on the belt of truthfulness is critical to stand firm and resisting in the spiritual war which we face. Moving on in the second half of verse 14, we find that the second piece of spiritual armor that we must put on is the breastplate of righteousness. And again, we must first look at a Roman soldier's breastplate really to understand this metaphor. Now, the breastplate that a Roman soldier wore normally was made of leather with overlapping pieces of metal and sometimes even bones sewn onto that leather. And this tough piece of armor was put on the soldier's chest and protected the vital organs from arrows and things like that. And though painful, you could survive an arrow to the arm or an arrow to the leg, but an arrow in the lung or the heart would ruin your whole day, to put it mildly. And Paul identifies this breastplate as the breastplate of righteousness. As Christians, we have received from the Lord the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And because of our faith in Christ, We stand robed in His righteousness. And this is what saved us from God's wrath, which we so richly deserve. The theologians refer to this as imputed righteousness. And all true Christians have it. And because of this, it makes no sense that that Paul would tell his Ephesian readers to put on what they already possessed. That wouldn't make any sense. So the righteousness referred to here would have to be practical righteousness. The breastplate that provides us 
protection from the flaming arrows of the evil one is righteous living. It's ordering our lives such that we are substantially living in obedience to the Lord. Now notice that I say substantially. This side of heaven, we will not be anywhere near perfect, but we must seek to live holy in the power of the Spirit. And really, this is the logical outworking of putting on the belt of truthfulness. If we make a commitment to sincerely and truthfully living the Christian life, then the next step is to commit ourselves to putting off sinful thoughts, actions, and attitudes, and putting on righteous ones. And this combination of the belt of truthfulness and the breastplate of righteous living is a substantial protection in our battle with the enemy of our souls. And again, this practical righteousness is the mark of those whom the Lord mightily uses in the spiritual battle. Notice how the Apostle Paul exhorts the Roman believers in Romans chapter 13, verses 12 through 14. He says, The night is almost gone, and the day is near. Therefore, lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor, there it is, the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day, not as in carousing and or drunkenness, nor in sexual promiscuity nor sensuality, not in strife and in jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regards to its lusts. So in very practical terms, what does putting on the breastplate of righteous and holy living, what does it involve? Essentially, it means that we make a deliberate decision to pursue being transformed into Christ's likeness. It means that we keep our noses daily in God's Word, that we allow the Spirit of God to identify areas in our lives where we need to put off the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. This is the biblical model for change, actually, to put off darkness and to put on light. And if God commands us to put some things off and to put some things else in its place, we can be confident that the Lord will provide the strength to do so as we trust in the Holy Spirit to empower us. After all, according to Peter, we have been given everything pertaining to life and godliness. And maybe you've heard the expression before about about having chinks in your armor. Have you guys ever heard that heard that expression before? Yeah, yeah, it's pretty common. Well, if you have a, a chink in your armor, it means that there's a little gap. There's a gap between the joints of the armor in your breastplate. It means that there's a small little area in your breastplate armor where an arrow could could kind of sneak through that little hole and skewer you. And these chinks are, are in our armor are little lusts that hang around our lives. They are little sins that we tolerate and maybe even have grown a little bit of affection for. And you know what? These chinks, they are what the devil and his buddies fire their flaming arrows at. That's what they go after. They study us. They know where the little gaps in our armor are. And they take careful aim at them. For this reason, even as committed Christians, with the breastplate of righteousness, of righteous living firmly in place, we need to invite the Lord to do chink identification and repair in our lives. But there's another important aspect to putting on the breastplate of righteous, holy living. The Scriptures make it clear that drawing near to the Lord, drawing near and abiding in His presence, actually transforms us and makes us holy like Him. Paul told the Corinthians that we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in the mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into His same likeness, into holiness, from one degree of glory to another. 
Part of putting on the breastplate of righteousness is developing the spiritual discipline of drawing near and remaining near to God each day, allowing Him to reveal Himself and to speak truth into our lives. Consistently doing this will progressively transform us into the likeness of Christ, manifesting holiness and righteous living. In my own life, as I have thought through this passage, I have renewed my praying of Psalm 139, verses 24 through 25. And many of you guys know this. In this psalm, David prayed. He said, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there be any hurtful way in me, Lord, and reveal those and lead me in the everlasting way. I'm inviting the Lord to reveal chinks in my armor so that I may put them off and put holy practices in their place. In particular, I am determined to bring every one of my thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. For me, my thought life is where so much of the devil's schemes are targeted. And I desire righteousness and holiness, especially in my thought life. So, where are you at today with the breastplate of practical righteousness? Have you ever really gotten serious about your Christian walk and purpose to put the breastplate on? If not, make today the day that you go before the Lord and put it on. Then make sure that you are ingesting God's Word each day, allowing the Holy Spirit to reveal where sin must be put off and righteousness put on. Some of you may have already put on the breastplate, but you, but you know that there are chinks in the armor. You may have allowed sins to hang around and frankly grown kind of fond of them. But today, realize that the Lord wants to do chink repair and truly make you fit for the spiritual battle. And if this is you, confess to the Lord that you have tolerated sin in your life and ask Him to begin the work of showing you what must be put off and what must be put on. And for all of us who desire to live holy lives in obedience before the Lord, we must cultivate the discipline of drawing near to Him each day, listening to what the Lord has to say through His Word. Referring to your message outline, putting on the breastplate of righteousness means that we commit ourselves to daily, moment-by-moment obedience to the Lord and communion with Him. The goal is righteous and holy living. The practices involved include chink removal and living in constant fellowship with the Lord. Now let's move on to verse 15 in our text to the third piece of spiritual armor that we must put on, which is the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, the wording of this verse gives us a clue that the Paul's metaphor here is about putting on some sort of shoes. And a Roman soldier preparing for battle put on a pair of shoes called caligae, and they were essentially very heavy-soled sandals with a leather strap that went up their legs and hobnails driven into the bottom of each one of the sandals. Essentially, they were kind of like, like sandal cleats, so to speak. And they helped a soldier keep his footing in the midst of close quarter combat. If you lost your footing during a fight and went down, you were usually done for. And in the spiritual battle, you can put on the breastplate of righteousness. You can put on the belt of truth, but if you don't prepare your feet properly, you're going to go down hard. Now, the shoes are referred to as the preparation or readiness, that's what the word means, of the gospel of peace. 
You know what the gospel is. It's the, it's the good news that God has provided a way through the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus so that those of us who trust Him may be saved from the wrath of God. And I hope that each one of you have put your faith in Christ. If you haven't, come talk to me because you need to do that today. But notice that Paul adds another phrase. He calls it the gospel of peace. The good news of the gospel certainly does provide peace. Notice what Paul says in Romans 5, 1 through 2. He says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, in which we stand. You see, the gospel causes us to know that we have peace with God. We have been reconciled to Him, and we are His friend. And beyond that, He now considers us His adopted children. Later on in the book of Romans, Paul exclaims, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who will be against us? He who did not spare His own Son, but delivered Him over for us all, how will He not also with Him freely give us all things? So it doesn't make any sense. And if it were not enough, at the end of the chapter, Paul is almost shouting with joy when he writes this. He says, But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through Him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depths, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. You see, the profound realities of the gospel of peace, they are our source of strength in the midst of the battle which we find ourselves in. They keep our feet anchored to the ground when the accuser of the brethren, the devil, reminds us of how unrighteous we are. And he does that, doesn't he? The gospel of peace tells us that God has forgiven us And we are now His dearly beloved children. And we must must preach this gospel to ourselves in the midst of the spiritual battle, lest we become discouraged and give up. Referring to your message outline, putting on the preparation of the gospel of peace on our feet means that we regularly remind ourselves that we are now at peace with God through the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are now His dearly beloved children. This gives us confidence in the spiritual battle when the devil seeks to discourage us. Now you'll find, you'll note that in your bulletin, on the page page facing the message outline, that there are a series of questions designed to aid you in applying what we've talked about this morning. I would encourage you to join me this week and take some time to work through those questions which will allow you to really think through what's been talked about here and apply them in your own life. In closing, whether we like it or not, we're at war. And though we cannot see our enemy, the devil and his demons nonetheless are fully committed, ever-present, formidable foes. But as we put on the full armor of God and resist and stand firm, we will win. So, put on the belt of truthfulness. Put on the breastplate of righteous and holy living and put on your feet the preparation of the gospel of peace. Put them on. Put them all on. And keep them on too. Let's pray. Lord, thank You that though We are in a spiritual battle. You have graciously provided everything that we need to triumph. Oh, strengthen us, Lord, to 
understand the nature of the spiritual armor that you've given us and to be diligent to put it on and wear it. Thank you that ultimately, someday, Jesus will rout our mutual enemy and your church will enjoy your presence, enemy-free forevermore. Lord, bring that day about soon. Hey, thanks for being with us today. It's always a pleasure to serve you with this CD ministry. Here at Rancho Baptist Church, our mission is to glorify God by making disciples who love God, love others, and live to reach their world for Christ. And if you have any questions regarding this sermon, or just perhaps knowing God in a deeper way, don't hesitate to give us a call. Our phone number is area code 951-676-2911. Or you can reach us on the web at www. Dot Rancho Baptist Church dot org. That's www dot Rancho Baptist Church dot org. Have a great day in the Lord and God bless you as you continue to walk with Him.